Today I'm going to be doing a teardown on this. This is a Digital Payment Technologies Loop Parking Station. Uh, this is a, a payment terminal meant to go out in a parking lot so that people can pay for parking spots. These units came with a 12 volt 35 amp hour AGM lead acid battery. Uh, I've already robbed those for this project. So just to fire this up to give a quick rundown I've hooked it up to a little lead acid uh, gel cell battery. So let's power it up. Now we wait. Hey, it's uh, this thing's running Windows CE, uh, from what I gather, and uh, it's a speed demon. Okay, that's pretty much all it does. Let me zoom in. I found enough of a manual on this thing somewhere to find that if I go cancel, cancel, okay. No, cancel, okay, okay. <laughs> Voltage low, powering down. Oh no! We'll be right back. Here's a Bodge Jet power supply. All right, we're back. Let's make sure we're... Oh, you suck. Okay, it seems to want to keep doing this. We'll get to this later. So let's start down here. This is the money side of this thing. Uh, there's a door on the bottom here. That uh, The locks are gone. When I bought these, the locks are stripped out. The, where the money goes. So inside here, a big lock. That is a magnet for that thing. There, I'm guessing like a reed switch or Hall effect kind of dealy. Inside this area, there'd be normally be a battery shelf for the, the big lead acid battery. So down here, connectors for battery number one and battery number two, which is an option that these aren't outfitted for. Up there is uh, where the power would come in. So this runs off a 120 volt circuit. There's this kind of little PDU dealy tucked up inside there. Also in here is this, which is where the coin bin would attach. One other detail I wanted to point out here was uh, how they weatherproofed the, where the door meets the cabinet. Um, there's no weather stripping, there's no seal there, there's nothing. There's just a steel door. Uh, but this lip here is all that's needed. So that catches the water and keeps it from getting in between this gap, getting inside the cabinet. It almost looks like it's stainless on the door. And on the other side, that is latched by this uh, pretty robust looking mechanism here that captures those pins. That's the back of the LCD screen. The back of the keypad is a very basic matrix interface. This is the coin slot. This is the credit card reader where the, the uh, receipts go out. There's this here, this little thing here, which is plumbed into the coin acceptor. The reject chute from the coin acceptor goes there. This machine gives no change. That's just for the change it doesn't like. Up in the main cabinet, that's the bottom side of the cell antenna. Here's the cell modem it uses. Main controller, processor, brains of the operation. This is something interesting. This is a heater. This is, I think it's a 700 watt space heater produced in Germany to the most expensive standards possible, I'm sure. These units can be heated for cold climates to keep them functioning properly because LCD screens get sluggish and I'm guessing the thermal printer doesn't like the cold either. Yeah, and underneath the heater is a battery charger. 12 volt intelligent battery charger, reliable rugged waterproof surge and ignition protected. AC input 100, 132 volts AC, so yeah, this isn't good for everywhere in the world. This is the coin acceptor with its little reject door operation. These are just uh, kind of a standard off the shelf dealy. And then down here, receipt printer. And that cylinder is for the reel of paper that goes into this. I guess it takes a fairly large reel so that the machine doesn't need to be continually 
babysat. And that's all that's inside, really. Oh, oh, no, we forgot that. There is a, a horn. Uh, this has kind of a tamper alarm um, so that if the enclosure is open without permission, it'll freak out. Back there is some kind of shock sensor. The website of the company that sells them isn't very clear on what that means. And like the door below, there's another uh, door sensor uh, and a magnet over here. I'm assuming that's a magnet. I haven't I don't have anything around. Uh, so let's start pulling some pieces out. It's got just two big connectors. And that controller board plugs into this breakout board that kind of powers the whole system. This is kind of an interesting approach. I don't know if this was because they realized after the fact that you couldn't get the controller out because the lip on the door here is in the way, but this whole thing is kind of hinged so you can pull it out, swing it out of the way, get your controller out and swing it back in. So we'll just unplug all this stuff. Yep. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Uh, how does this come out? I don't know. I see there's some nuts behind it. So here's the breakout board off the end of that thing. Everything's kind of labeled spare serial MDB, MDB, modem power battery, modem status LEDs, spare serial coin hopper, keypad and alarm. Interesting choice to put together. Maybe not. Accessory, credit card, uh, yeah, that's all. LCD, they cover that one. So they use these many, many pin connectors. I don't think they need as many pins as they've got, but... The uh, modem here is kind of held in with a combination of friction and gravity, I guess. Um, there's a power connector on here. So uh, the serial cable is actually screwed in on this one. Uh, oh, this connector. Oh, this is the. Is that the antenna? No, that was the antenna. That's not the power connector. Uh, this is the power connector, and then serial. But serial, we have to come out the front so we can get at the screws. So there's RS232, the antenna connector, and the power. And power is just you know, your typical. Uh, barrel connector, but it's got a threaded retaining ring on the connector so it doesn't fall out, which is kind of neat. So these two boards are uh, actually soldered together. Oh, SIM card. There's a, these units came with a SIM card. I haven't checked if they work or not. I'm assuming they've been deactivated. I guess that's the actual cellular. That is soldered with some headerless headers, I guess, directly onto the main modem board, which there's very little to the modem board. There's the power supply, RS-232 stuff, I don't know what that is. Not a whole lot, it looks like all the magic is being done by this module. Which, oh it's made by Multitech, so it's their own module they're using. But I can't really see what's going on in there, there's a giant package of some sort. Oh no it's not a giant package, it's a, like an RF can. Not a lot to see there. Now that SIM card comes out, just you know, yank it out. Looks like a Rogers card. One other thing I wanted to point out, there is a little door on the front to get to the SIM card. See? It says SIM. So I think for my next victim I'm going to extract this space heater, which is very easy because it's not actually screwed down. So here's the heater. This is a pretty solid feeling unit. It kind of looks like a uh, trip light UPS. Uh, there's a temperature setting on the front here. Which, for being a unit made by a German company, where did I see that? That's a Stego, made in Germany type CR030, 120 volt. Uh, for, for being made in Germany, I find it a bit weird that it's in Fahrenheit only. Uh, so it goes from 32 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So people like things warm. This thing's pretty solid. There's a big monster aluminum heat sink in there and a fan, and I'd plug it in and power it up. Except the plug has been replaced with a unit specific to this 
pay station. Don't see an immediate way into it, so I'm gonna have to uh, poke around at this for a minute. Oh, look at that, right there. Big screw. So there's nothing terribly exciting inside. Some terminals for power. A, uh, let's see if I make it. Yeah, just a bimetallic thermostat, kind of dealy. And then a little uh, overload. So this thing doesn't burn your house down. It doesn't get me what I wanted. I want to know how it works. Ah. Okay, I managed to pop this thing off and get myself a layer deeper. So now, I think I can just. Oh, they're not even tight. And we're apart. There's a uh, very nice uh, die cast frame fan. And then the, the heating element appears to either intentionally or unintentionally be melted, welded into uh, this plastic housing bit here. So this, I can't get it apart any further, but I'm guessing that that's just a big resistive heating element buried inside a hole bored into this thing. Oh, oh it wants to come out, but I can't get it out. Oh, 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 oh. there we go. Huh. So that is somewhat melted looking, which is a bit alarming. Oh, that's definitely melted looking. Look at that. I wonder if this thing accidentally was run when it was hot out. And then, what's in here? Probably wrecking it. No? So yeah, there's just a, a big heating element with no thermal transfer goop or anything. I guess you wouldn't want to. Um, that is a very tight fit. It's almost, uh, it's creating like that kind of gas piston effect. And that's it. That, the fan, the box. Huh. All melted together. Forgot this bit. Gentlemen! This appears to be. Mmm. Yes, yes, that's PA6. Uh, the kind of plastic isn't marked, but it's definitely some kind of uh, glass reinforced nylon because these things feel alarmingly tough. Alarmingly, I'm scared of it. Okay, so the dismay of the nanny state fanboys who watch my channel. I've uh, plugged this thing in. Let's see if it's going to spark in my face. That's a very weird sounding heater. There's a lot of air though. I'm not feeling any heat. Give it a minute. All right, so it's been running a few minutes. It's, I can feel heat. This isn't always the best check, but what's it saying? 40 degrees, but this is warm. It's not hot, but I guess for heating electronics enclosure, that's what you want. It's kind of a low, uh, low power density heater. I might explain the size, but 700 watt heater, so, huh. All right, well, it's annoying, so I'm gonna shut it off. All right, so I've got this thing unplugged. That heat sink is almost unbearably hot to touch. Um, so I don't know if this is just terrible at conducting the heat out into where the fan is, but uh, I can see why this thing had melted itself through. It's probably from the, the fan and the heater turn on and off at the same time. So when the fan shuts off, there's a lot of heat still wrapped up inside this heat sink. Hmm. Not the best German engineering. I just went to put this cover back on. I noticed that it's pretty badly melted right there where these standoffs uh, touch the heat sink. It's all melted. So not in the best shape. So I'm wondering if because there's such poor transfer of heat from that central portion out to the, the ribs of the heat sink that uh, if this thing's been running for a long time, we have cold winters here and they're not that cold, but this cabinet isn't insulated. So if it's minus 20 out, this thing's probably gonna run continually to try to keep that cabinet warm because there's so much loss. The whole cabinet will act as a heat sink to the outside air. So this thing will run nonstop. 
uh, which means this central core area is going to reach the whatever its maximum temperature is and stay there and it's going to melt everything and just not built for Canadian winters. So you may have noticed there's no power supply in this unit. There's a battery and a battery charger and that's it. Uh, and all the DC supplies are derived from that 12 volt battery. So this battery charger is the unit's power supply. This is all it's got. And there's a charger. This is just, uh, it feels like a potted unit. Nothing exciting about this. So I flipped this over and uh, contemplated taking the screws out and I realized that's the potting compound right there. So this thing's built, put in the box, flipped over and filled to the top with potting compound. Um, after they put a very lovely colorful array of stickers on there. Uh, next up is the coin acceptor. That's this guy. Now I'm pretty sure, oh, I gotta put this light down. Um, this just kind of does a up and over kind of, yeah. That was easy. Oh, there's a connector on the back. Here's the coin acceptor. Now it says on here that this takes one dollar and two dollar buy metal returned. Oh, that means it takes one dollar and two dollar coins, which I happen to have. An assortment. We have a star. And an assortment of Canadian one dollar and two dollar coins. In 2015. Now they changed the formulation of our tunies at some point to be even cheaper. But uh Oh, what just happened? Let's see. Comes out. It's hard to tell. So that's coming out. There's two slots on the bottom of this thing. That's the reject. The upper one's the reject slot, and the lower one's the uh, keeper slot. Uh, doesn't like that toonie. Didn't like that one. Looney. They're all coming out the reject slot. Took the back off, and there is uh, an electromagnet here. This is actually quite a delicate movement. And that seems to be actuating. Ah. So there's a diverter door. So yeah, that's right. It doesn't need to have power. So when this is operated, you can kind of see there's a diverter door drops down into the, the uh, reject coin stream to pick off the good coins. Let's try this thing out with that actuated. I think that came out the right slot. Yeah, so now we're coming out the bottom slot. I got myself a nickel. Let's see what happens with the nickel. So I push the thingy. Huh. Oh, I get it. This thing doesn't operate only, or when the unit's powered on, this only operates when a good coin is detected. Otherwise, this is stays closed. So the whole time the coin's falling, it's figure out when it, if it's good or not. And if it's good, whoop, this says keep, and it pops it into the keep chute. So yeah, powered off, it will discard, shoot every coin out automatically. Powered on, it'll only keep the coins that it thinks it should keep. So this thing is not designed to be serviced. All of the the detector magnetics, which seems to be primarily what it uses, which I guess makes sense. Uh, it's all soldered directly onto this board. This is a controller board. It's got a NXP, uh, I can't tell what that is. Some kind of microcontroller. They stuck their label, CoinCo label over the uh, part number. What else is in there? 4000 series logic and mm, power supply stuff and I can't see far enough into that side what's going on there. So this uses a combination of the magnetic uh, detection and there's uh, optical sensors here as well I'm guessing to check for the presence of coins. So I think before I do anything more with this I gotta look at the, the data sheets and figure out what voltages to apply and see if this wants to work and then I will break it. So over on this side, there's another board. It's very much uh, glued down. I can't get that one out. Hmm. But there's more magnetics on this board as well. R more. So that'll uh, I'll save for a separate teardown. So the last thing that's any fun in here is uh, this printer. I guess the siren's fun. You can't see. Pop that out next. 
Okay, so here's the printer. This is set up for a fairly large spool of paper, thermal paper, two and a quarter inch, I think. I tried to find some two and a quarter inch thermal paper to put into this, but without buying a $60 crate of the stuff, I can't get any. Not immediately. So on the side are three mystery ports. I know that serial. That's uh, a goofy locking DIN style, mini DIN style power connector. And is that a parallel port? I don't know. And then I noticed, tucked away on the bottom here, is a mini USB port. Hmm. Odd place to put it. Seems like an afterthought. Oh, there's some dip switches tucked in the end there. There is a RJ11 style cable 4P4C tied into this box here which I'm guessing has to do with this little optical sensor there which is to detect when the paper's low. So on the front it says future logic and there's an error and status LED, a cut button and a feed. So given that this prints out parking receipts it's got a cutter built in so it can print your receipt and slice it off and spit it into the chute. So I'm guessing that's hidden somewhere inside here. So this appears to be a Future Logic KMB 60-2. You know what drives me batty is when a piece of hardware is built so that the D sub mounting screws have to be removed in order to remove a circuit board. It, it just seems ridiculous that I should have to take apart connectors to take something apart. All right, we're inside. So there's a, a big Atmel microcontroller, I'm guessing, maybe. It has its own RAM um, and a little TI dude that's probably driving the printhead. So it seems like it has some capabilities. In terms of interfaces, I think this is a parallel port, this mystery port here, because uh, I see a bunch of wires. Um, of course, nothing is marked on this board. J10, J23. I'm sure there's a manual for this. It's an OEM module. So I'm guessing the USB port is for diagnostics, but uh, until I figure out this power connector, I can't power this thing up and test it out. It's interesting, there's a resistor in the heat shrink tube here on these wires that maybe goes to, I don't know, hard to tell. This front panel, a little bit of flex here, says tested 150807 but the date code on everything else is 2012 so I guess they ordered a bajillion of those and then uh, <laughs> just slowly been using them as they've uh, been building these printers gives you an idea of their lack of volume not too much to see until I can power it up and play around with it a bit so this is interesting for whatever reason the uh, paper sensor is on RJ11 connectors on both ends. It just seems like an overkill. And there's just a little, I'm guessing infrared reflective kind of dealy. That's on this rinky-dink track here, so you can set your threshold for paper lowness. But it, it looks like it's an infuriating thing to set up because you can't, oh, I see. You can't like adjust it and tighten the screws. You have to have this lid on and these screws in through that. Alright, so you have to so you have to have that lid kind of on but loose and uh, and then you can kind of grab hold of this cable and manually futz this thing into position where you want it and it's kind of floppy and uh, once you get it there you have to flip it around and tighten those two screws back up. Just seems a little for something built like a tank. Eh, anyway. So back looking at the front of this, uh, this box here is the, the cutting mechanism. And it, it seems to come out, but it, I can't get it to pop out very readily. But I don't see a way to replace the blade, so it, I'm, I'm guessing they've got like a, a lifetime blade or... Oh, it just seems weird that the only way to replace the blade is to replace the whole unit. Uh, I also like that. They've got the universal color of paper jam release levers, a little blue plastic guy here. Well, I said I was done, but I forgot about the door. So we've still got the uh, LCD screen, the keypad, and the credit card reader to take a peek at. So I'm almost there. I'm guessing that comes on. Right. 
I don't think there's going to be a lot to see on this. So here is the screen. There's nothing exciting here at all. Uh, it looks like it has room for some buttons of its own. It's a backlight driver. There's no visible circuitry on this. Caution, high voltage. Just the backlight. The rest of it is inside the module itself, which is connected with the header down there. So this is just basically a breakout board. So this is a part created for the system because it's got one of their part numbers, 175.0007. So this breakout is specific. And that seems a bit, I don't know. You would think there'd be an off-the-shelf module available. Basically, this just reroutes this connector to the, the header on the back of the LCD screen that you can't see. This is the keypad assembly, the ruggedized, tamper-abuse-proof keypad. This feels a bit chicken shit. There's the flex comes out and it's zip-tied on to a header. Come on, guys. So this is a Dewhurst model made in England. Uh, which is why it has an earth a tab nut, not a grounding tab. Um, inside, it's surprisingly anticlimactic. There's... Uh, um, these are kind of tactile dome switches, but they're clear. So, what's going on there? Oh, I see. So, there's a tactile dome with up to two layers that are pressed into each other. Two conductive layers. And then, these are the... Uh, the buttons are all kind of in this separate unit. Nothing too terribly exciting. Do I need to? No, I'm not going to bother taking the front off. So I find this a bit infuriating. You make this nice rugged eyes skookum keypad unit. Um, you know, this thing's solid. Those are it's, it's very nicely made. And then you make the output a little shitty piece of flex that comes out the bottom. And then these guys just stick on a zip tie thing. Like, come on, people. I don't get that. This is probably more than $100. Probably a couple hundred bucks for this unit, for this ruggedized keypad. And then you've got this fragile little bit of flex poking out the bottom that you have to deal with on your system integration. Just seems ridiculous. Uh, so this is the card reader out of the unit. Nothing really exciting here. Uh, ID tech. It looks like it's got a little power supply board piggybacked on the back here. And by power supply, I mean, what is that? Yeah, it's got a uh, full wave bridge rectifier, a 7805 regulator, and a couple caps. So it's got a five volt. So I got myself a uh, card here to try out in the the reader. Um, I, I find I don't know a lot about it, but I I, I find it interesting. The, the things that are done to to engineer around nefarious actors, bad actors. Here's the front of the card reader. Things like the fact that the, this card reader can't completely read a card until it's been fully inserted into this thing. I'm pretty sure that has something to do with it. There's a micro switch that clicks when it hits the end. Um, this has... Oops. Stray washer. Has a... It says a chip reader in it. Um, as well as the mag stripe reader. We're kind of halfway between the two standards in Canada. Actually, we're we're just about entirely, this doesn't have a chip, but whatever. We're just about entirely switched over to uh, chip cards. So the, the mag stripe usually doesn't work in most places. The reason these machines, these, these parking um, stations, pay stations, were put up for sale is because they're not PCI compliant. But that was a software problem, not a the hardware problem. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to. This is. Oh, there's something interesting there. So there's this little doodad here. It looks like it looks like a tiny neodymium magnet um, that's somehow actuated by the card going in. I don't know what purpose it serves. You can hear it. Oh, there's a little on the side here. Maybe it's just a card detection. Oh, I bet. Oh. It looks like it's a card detector with like a Hall effect sensor, but that seems like a weird way of doing it. 
Anyway, I won't. I don't want to get too into depth with that bit. That will probably also save for a separate exploration. So, so uh, that, that's empty now. There's no other electronics inside. There's this shock sensor, but there's nothing to see on that. It's just a plastic box. So I'm gonna strip out the cabling, and then the next thing I want to do is look at this front casting. This is a piece of die cast material, and it's a monster. So I kind of want to drag it out and see how big it really is. So one thing I've kind of wondered about seeing these things in the wild are these. This looks like like a infrared transmitter receiver pair, like there's holes for that. And on the back of the panel, there's four studs, but there isn't actually anything there. So it's I'm guessing an option. <clears throat> oh, that's in there pretty good. This is uh the magnet from the the door sensor and uh, it, uh, it answers two things. The door itself is actually stainless steel because it doesn't stick to it, but it does stick to my steel garage door. Uh, the main body of the unit is also magnetic, so it's just the door that's stainless steel. I don't know what's up with that. Okay, so I've got all the screws out. Now this thing's held in with a hundred gallons of silicone sealant. Uh, I can break it free with just a, a mediocre amount of effort. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's rain and washers. heavy, I'd say, 20 pound casting. Um, in places, it, it feels like it's up to a quarter inch thick. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's most of the weight of the door right there. So that's that. Uh, I didn't pull off the antenna yet. I don't want to wreck it, and it's not immediately clear how that goes in, unless... No. Um, so part of the reason for me wanting these was that they were a really nice weatherproof outdoor enclosure. And I was curious how much of a, a wound I would need to fix with that, that panel removed. And it leaves a nice flat surface. It'd be fairly easy to bolt something on that silicones over all of this missingness. I don't know. It's a whole bunch of mostly off the shelf stuff except for the controller, which uh, I'll dig into that further in a separate video. Mostly off the shelf pieces in here. Um, even the controller probably could have been off the shelf. And uh, just a whole bunch of crap wired together um, with some really mediocre software bolted on top of that. I found uh, some documents online that indicated that the uh, list price for one of these units uh, was around 12,000 US dollars, which is a bit mind blowing considering I paid 25 bucks a piece for them, and they're still in use. These aren't, these aren't even entirely obsolete yet. Uh, but, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? That's, that's still quite expensive, but when you look at this, it's, it's a whole bunch of custom hardware. Um, and I'm guessing actually a lot of the cost is in this custom enclosure, because going out and getting these things mass produced, going to a fab shop, and getting them to tool up, to, to weld these guys up. And this is solid. This is, it's all 16th inch thick steel. That's what, 12 gauge-ish. Um, 
it's 165 pounds with the electronics and with the electronics that takes 100 pounds, um, 120 pounds, 130 pounds. Uh, but it, it's one of those, it's, it's not built to a price. Um, this is, they're made for institutional markets, for local governments, for places like Impark to come in and do their evil deeds as well. Ah, it's interesting. It's neat to see what's inside. They've always infuriated me as being a piece of junk. Um, and uh, opening up, I was actually surprised at the quality of it. They are well built. Um, for the most part. Uh, it's just they, they fell down on the software side. This enclosure, I don't know. Oh, I need a big weatherproof enclosure for. One other detail I wanted to point out here was uh, how they weatherproofed the, where the door meets the cabinet. Um, there's no weather stripping, there's no seal there, there's nothing. There's just a steel door. Uh, but this lip here is all that's needed. So that catches the water and keeps it from getting in between this gap, and getting inside the cabinet. Anyway, thanks for watching. There'll be more videos coming for the other pieces that I've taken apart and kind of done a, a, a brief, quick rundown um, on the, the ones that is kind of glazed over, like the heater I went into because it's a heater. Um, but uh, yeah, there'll be more, more stuff coming as I get around to it.